Thank you. All right. So um, thanks for uh, thanks for the invitation. It's really fun to be here. This is my first time at uh, this summer school. It seems uh, like a lot of fun, and. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about machine learning for single cell and regulatory genomics, and I am promising to give a methods talk, but before we get to the methods, I want to um, make a pitch for uh, understanding the biology, having some biology, understanding where the data is coming from and why people are generating the data and what are the problems they're trying to solve. Okay, so I'm just going to start with a few slides of motivation and some vignettes for understanding regulation of gene expression in mammalian cells, okay? And uh, I don't know if, uh, I don't, maybe we don't have, uh, oh, you can see my, okay. So I, I hope people have this picture in their head when they think of gene regulation, okay? So we have the chromatin, it's a dynamic structure, and we are interested in what does it take to turn on a gene, okay? And here we see the transcription start site and we see the elongating transcript, this gene is on. Well, it involves first binding of transcription factors to distinguished sites in the genome. So we see transcription factors binding uh, at the promoter region, but also at these enhancer regions that can be quite far away in the linear genome. Uh, tens, hundreds of thousands of KB, sometimes a megabase or more. And they, uh, there is looping of the chromatin to bring the enhancer in close 3D proximity to the promoter, okay? And this is all happening in a cell type sp specific fashion, turning on different genes in different cell types. Um, the other important thing is that uh, the, the transcription factors are recognizing cognate sites in the genome, and we often represent them by a, a kind of binding motif. Okay, so we now have great techniques, uh, uh, both 1D epigenomic assays and 3D genomic assays to map this uh, regulatory landscape, okay? Um, so, in particular, I'm going to talk about ataxic and single cell ataxic for mapping these, uh, these, these events, these important uh, regulatory loci, as well as high C for understanding the connectivity, uh, the 3D connectivity uh, uh, of chromatin nucleus. Okay? And in, in, uh, as these uh, data types, data sources have become more uh, uh, ri widely available and just better in quality, it allows us to tackle new problems uh, with machine learning in order to decipher gene regulation. Okay, so just a few vignettes, all right, just to motivate, you know, I, I think we need to see what this data looks like, and I, I don't know uh, how much regulatory genomics you've seen so far. Some people I'm sure have seen a lot, okay, and I can, I could pull a lot of different papers. This is some, uh, you know, a paper I like of my own work um, where uh, we were showing that T cells that are tumor specific uh, progress in their chromatin state. They change their chromatin accessibility landscape and become dysfunctional in tumors, okay? And it's sometimes called T cell exhaustion. And we did that with ataxic, bulk ataxic back in the day. Uh, a taxic involves a transposase, that it's a tagmentation uh, um, method where we're cleaving and also adding sequencing adapters so we can map these regions of open chromatin where transcription factors are binding. Okay? And globally, a taxic is great for encoding cell state, but we can also look at specific loci. Okay? So this is uh, the gene. Uh, PDCD1. It's what encodes PD1 in the mouse. It's one of the most important immunotherapy targets. And uh, this is another locus. It's encoding interferon gamma. It's an effector molecule. And what you can see is in this liver cancer model, uh, as you wait more days, the T cells are changing their chromatin landscape uh, and specific 
uh, enhancers are becoming active or at least open. Other changes are happening elsewhere. And uh, this is encoding changes in gene expression, okay? So uh, these are functional T cells up here in green. These are the dysfunctional T cells, the, the tumor-specific T cells that don't work and don't, can, uh, don't kill cancer cells anymore. Um, and uh, uh, all of this is turning on PD-1 high and turning off interferon gamma. Okay, so gene expression changes uh, encoded by accessibility changes, okay? All right, so moving ahead a few years, you know, to do those experiments, a lot of mice gave their life, right? We had a kind of the functional T cells, we sorted, naive memory effector, we had all these days. Now you can do it uh, more simply without sorting, uh, or you sort for T cells and you can look at the whole T cell response, for example, in a chronic viral infection, okay? And you can see that uh, this is using single cell attack. Uh, there are naive cells, there are memory cells for previous infections, and then there, there, there are the cells that are activated by the current chronic viral infection. And you can even look at the single cell level, okay, and this is sort of pseudobulk data. There, there was a particular um, famous enhancer right here that you only see in exhausted T cells. And, and you can look and you can see that same accessible event in single cell, in single cells. Okay, so part of what we're going to talk about today is what you can do with single cell attack data, which is. Uh, a, a lot of fun, but presents new challenges. Okay, another just final motivating example. Um, so this is an example where we're not only looking at the change in the accessibility landscape, but the 3D organization of chromatin in a differentiation process. So uh, this is uh, data with uh, Dunwei Huangfu uh, and Afi Apostolou. Uh, in the 40 Nucleon project, and it's a, 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 a directed differentiation data. You take human ES cells and you kind of stage-wise differentiate them uh, uh, along pancreatic differentiation towards making beta cells that can secrete insulin in a dish, okay? And we're looking over uh, the locus that encodes uh, PDX1, it's an important uh, pancreatic gene, uh, it's a transcription factor, it's also a diabetes gene, and we're seeing with high C as well as uh, attack seek that um, not only is the accessibility changing, but you're establishing these 3D contacts. Okay, I'm going to talk about high C more. I was told no one's talked about high C, <laughs> so I'm going to uh, tell you more later, uh, but for now, this high C, what I'm showing is a contact matrix, which is sort of giving you um, uh, some normalized counts between bin I and bin J in the genome, okay? And it's telling you something about the frequency of physical interaction between I and J, bin I and bin J, okay? And um, I'll also tell you more about our approach for doing this uh, statistical normalization and, and assigning significance to these interactions, um, and that's called high CDC, okay? But you can kind of, you can see this 3D interaction. Everyone with me? Okay. <laughs> okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today is um, three methods, okay? And all motivated by this idea of um, trying to analyze single cell attack properly um, and, and, and learn about gene regulation, in, including what enhancers are regulating what genes. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is a sequence-informed embedding algorithm for single cell attack. Uh, then I'm gonna show a new method um, for predicting the high c contact map from single cell attack alone, okay? And then finally, I'm going to uh, show a method, very simple machine learning method, for using multiome data, single cell uh, data where you have a single cell attack and single cell RNA readouts from the same cells. And um, show how you can learn single cell regression models 
uh, that will allow you to link enhancers to genes and also interpret uh, uh, disease-associated genetic variants in a cell type-specific fashion. Okay, all right, so um, let's start. Okay, cell space. So um, the goal here is, you know, I I've already shown you um, some single cell attack in the uh, motivating vignettes. Uh, here's some nice data uh, from Buenrostra et al. looking at uh, bone marrow, so uh, hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, and you can see they've kind of uh, uh, grouped into different cell types. But if you do a pseudobulk, you sum up all the signals, it looks very much like bulk attack. Okay? Um, so you can resolve, you can discover cell populations in single cell attack. You can also do motif analyses at a single cell resolution. It's very, very fun, very cool. Uh, but it also presents challenges. Okay? So you have very sparse data, right? If you look in this figure and you look at the dynamic range, you see that it's zero, one, or two, right? Because you, in a deployed genome, you have two um, chances of seeing that event to uh, places to get a read. Um, and the space that you're looking at um, is all genomic loci that might be open, right? That's bigger than the number of genes. All right, so it's, a, it's kind of a higher dimensional um, data type than single cell RNA. Okay, most methods um, just use uh, a single cell RNA-like pipeline. Uh, so in single cell RNA, you create uh, cells by genes matrix, you do dimensionality reduction, uh, you do a, a nearest neighbor graph, you do a manifold embedding, okay? And, and most methods for single cell attack say, well, let's start with the cells by peaks or cells by genomic tiles matrix, and let's just do what we did for single cell RNA, okay? And that seems to get you somewhere, but there's a problem, okay? So this is a standard analysis uh, that I'm showing. Uh, I hope that the, I hope the slides look okay. They, I think they look okay. <laughs> okay. so. Um, it looks like there's structure, it looks like there's cell types, you can cluster, but there's a problem, okay? So you can see that there are two sets of green cells. The green cells are the, the uh, hematopoietic stem cells and, and MPPs, and they're in different places because they're from different donors, okay? So there's a batch effect that confounds the analysis, and it's, it's quite tricky. Okay, so um, the idea in cell space is that we have more information, which is that at accessible loci, we have sequence information, the DNA sequence, and that's uh, what is um, important. And maybe the underlying sequence will be more conserved between batches than the, the peaks or other, you know, it will, it will um, uh, help us mitigate batch effects. Okay, so here's the approach. Um, we are going to learn an embedding of cells and DNA camers into the same latent space, okay? And it works like this. Um, we can start uh, with a set of peaks, but it's actually better just to start with uh, uh, 500 base pair bins. They're called tiles in single cell attack analysis. Okay, so we just take tiles, we sample a sequence, and then we turn that sequence into a bag of camers, and, and we think of this, uh, um, this sequence as a training example, and that sequence is open in some cells and closed in other cells, okay? So we're gonna adjust our embedding of cells and camers so that the induced embedding of, um, of my sampled sequence is close to cells in which it's opened and far away from cells in which it's closed. Make sense? So, so we're going to um, iteratively update this embedding of cells and camers with this, this uh, uh, idea in mind. Okay, we're not explicitly embedding peaks or 
positions, okay? It's, it's only, we're only explicitly embedding k-mers and cells. Uh, after the fact, we can also take motifs, DNA motifs, and from the k-mer embedding, we can embed motifs into the same latent space, all right? Um, I put this slide just in case people like, you know, I'm just, it just says this, the same thing I already said, but with an equation, right? So you can think of, um, and, and we use this, this, the algorithm is called star space. It was developed for um, tweets and hashtags, okay, that you co-embed tweets and hashtags. Um, I don't know if that's helpful to know. <laughs> okay, so, but our examples are, um, the left-hand side are the, the set of k-mers in the sampled sequence. The right-hand side is a positive cell, right? And then we're trying to optimize this margin-based loss, right? So we're trying to push the, um, the left side closer to the positive right side and farther away from um, the, uh, a bunch of sampled negative cells. Okay, we want that distance. Uh, the, it closer to the positive than the negative by a margin, okay? And once it satisfies the margin, we stop pushing, okay? And, and this is just stochastic gradient descent. Okay, there are other tricks I'm not telling you. We're not actually using a bag of, of cameras. There's also a kind of um, n-gram approach. Uh, I, I can answer uh, and if anyone really wants the details, okay? So what happens, okay, when you use the same, this uh, cell space as your latent embedding, and then you do your nearest neighbor graph and you do a UMAP, um, you can see that it has mitigated batch effects, okay? So we're not doing any explicit batch correction, and once again, this is the standard approach in the corner. Yeah, I think you can, you, the, the resolution isn't great, but you can see that actually the latent structure that has been captured looks good, okay? So this is the hematopoietic hierarchy. Um, hematopoietic stem cells give rise to everything else. And you can actually see that that um, hierarchical relationship is captured in the embedding. Um, I've also embedded a bunch of motifs. If anyone knows the system, you can see that specific transcription factors that are active in certain hematopoietic cell types are embedded, the, the motif is embedded close to the cells in which it is active, okay, like um, HOXA9 in hematopoietic stem cells. Um, and in fact, you can, after using this latent embedding, you can use a trajectory uh, method like Palantir, start in a hematopoietic stem cell, and you will find all the most um, differentiated cell types as endpoints in the analysis. Okay? Question. Okay. So um, what more can we do with the latent Kamer embedding? Um, we were asked in review, actually, can you discover novel motifs? Okay, well, you, maybe you can, but how do you validate a novel motif? So what we did was um, we showed that you could de novo find the known motifs, okay? So you have all your cells embedded, you have different clusters of cells, and the, the k-mers we use are eight mers. They tend to be a bit short to work with, so we used the k-mer embedding to embed 10 mers, and then we looked for 10 mers that were close to each of the cell types and clustered them, and we retrieved a bunch of known motifs. Okay, so there really is meaning in this underlying Kamer embedding. Um, okay. Um, one thing that is uh, great about single cell attack is that you can, through various scores, kind of infer motif activities. Um, we wanted to see uh, this idea of embedding the motif and looking at similarity in the latent space to the cells, that, that should give a motif score and how, how good is that score. Okay, so this is um, our scores from cell space at the top and this is actually um, human cortex data, so brain data, and it's multiome. So we have um, 
an RNA readout as well, so we know where the transcription factor is expressed. And what you can see is that with cell space, you have pretty good correlation between the cells in which the transcription factor is expressed and where we think the motif should be active. Okay, so I, I just wanted to um, mention this other uh, model, very nice model called single cell Bassett. It's a deep learning sequence model that learns, um, it learns an, uh, an embedding for uh, peaks, for ataxic peaks, as well as a kind of position for cells. Um, uh, at, uh, and it also has a method for inferring motif activities. But what you can see, and, and this is a, you know, something, a, a cautionary note for all sequence models and regulatory genomics, right, that sometimes you're not capturing the right thing, okay? So even the, though this embedding looks okay, uh, for example, in this first uh, uh, column, we're looking at, um, it, you can barely see it, and I can barely see it, but it's, it's PAC6. It's only supposed to be active in radial glia, and you can see the activity is all wrong. Okay, so, so somehow that motif is not captured by the, the deep model, but, but it's captured in, in cell space. Okay, um, a little bit more on cell space. Um, so I, I you know, showed you a batch mitigation in a very small data set. This is a bigger data set. This is patient data. Uh, this is from Satpati et al. They were um, collecting bone marrow as well as peripheral blood, many patients. In the paper, they presented this embedding. They had to do a bespoke batch correction. So they did a, little, a lot of work to um, clean up batch effects and then do the clustering and annotation, and, and this is what they produced, okay? And this is just taking their data and embedding with cell space and then doing a, a standard um, visualization, no batch correction, okay? So the sequence information is mitigating the batch effects. And I'm also showing, again, for people who like lymphocytes, <laughs> um, you can do the cell space embedding for just the lymphocytes, and you can actually see the relationships, what's close to what makes some sense in terms of developmental relationships between these cell types. Okay, just a few more. Um, you know, these aren't very beautiful uh, slides, I have to say, you know, but uh, we, wa we, wanted to, um, we wanted to show we could solve a problem that no other method could solve because that seems to be the standard for publication <laughs> these days, right? So what, what can we do that nobody can do? Well, what if you have two data sets that have already been processed relative to a peak atlas? They, they have their own peak atlases, and they're different, right? So they're overlapping, but not the same. And so your cell by peaks matrix is different for the two. So it's uncorrectable, you know, like it's uncorrectable. But with cell space, you can st still embed both um, uh, the cells from batch one and batch two. Uh, and the only thing you have to change is make sure that you, when you sample from negative cells, you don't sample from the other batch. You don't want to push them up apart. But after that change, you actually can do a pretty good job of mapping both data sets to um, the same latent space. You can cluster and recover the right cell types. The annotations are good. Okay, so I don't recommend this. <laughs> like, I don't recommend having everybody process their own data and then trying to integrate afterwards, but, but it, it's something you can do. Okay, and final thing, I, again, not a beautiful, uh, we, we were asked to, sh you know, apply to a big data set. So it, a few hundred thousand isn't big enough. You have to do more like a million cells. Okay, so this is, um, it's all engineered to work at large scale. This is a big human fetal single cell atlas, which has uh, over 700,000 cells, 23 donors, different batches. And 
in the actual paper, in the paper that this comes from, they never embedded their whole data set. They sampled and then showed the UMAP. Um, so here you can actually map all, all your data <laughs> to the same latent space. And I'm, I'm just showing that it's not just by tissue. You can see that, for example, uh, different lymphocytes from different tissues are, are, are mapping to, to one um, region. Okay, so it's learning some reasonable structure. The batch integration looks good, okay? And no explicit batch correction. So that's what I want to say about cell space. Um, it's a DNA KMER-based embedding. It's highly scalable. Uh, there are different ways of training it, different choices, variable peaks, the whole peak atlas, tiles. Um, we can embed DNA motifs and then impute uh, like activity scores for motifs, and it often mitigates batch effects, uh, so uh, alleviating the need for an explicit batch correction. Okay. Um, all right. I think I'm going f more slowly. But <laughs> let, let me. I, I wanted to just. Um, so n next uh, model is uh, chromafold, and this is about predicting the contact map. I, I uh, added these slides when I found out that my talk was actually 45 minutes instead of 30 minutes, because <laughs> I think it changed. But uh, maybe I have too many slides. But I just wanted to, you know, if you haven't seen HiC. This is what HiC and, and sort of similar chromosome uh, confirmation capture uh, assays look like. Okay, so essentially, um, you are trying to capture interactions between chromatin that are sort of stabilized by proteins. Um, and so you first cross-link your DNA in C2 in the nucleus. Uh, you do a restriction enzyme digest, so you're, you're kind of here. Uh, you um, uh, fill the ends and mark with biotin, okay, and then you shear and you're pulling down on the biotin. And you have paired end reads where, uh, you, so you do sequencing, paired end sequencing, and the pair of reads, which we call the anchors, might come from very distal um, regions in the linear genome, bin I, bin J, but we know that because we got a read, they were close in 3D in, you know, in a, a cell in the input data, okay? So what we do is we create a contact matrix, okay? So basically, count I, J is the number of paired end reads with anchors in bin I, bin J, okay? And uh, I'm gonna go through this quickly. You, it's actually really fascinating data because you see different structures at different levels. So when you zoom into about the megabase level, you see these topologically associating domains, TADs, okay, so regions that are sort of self-interacting. And sometimes you see these kind of visible loops, which are, you know, we think of them as maybe they're stabilized by CTCF and cohesin, okay, some loop like that. But um, as the data has got better, you can actually see more than um, by, by applying the right statistical method than just by looking for spots in the map, okay? So the traditional analysis is kind of an image processing analysis where we're looking for bright spots after some normalization perhaps surrounded by less bright regions, okay? So you can imagine looking for these spots by some kind of computational procedure. Okay, it's very conservative. So you mostly get these kind of CTCF cohesin loops, very strong um, uh, interactions. Um, there's no statistics, right? So it's, it's hard to say what's the significance, what's, what are all my calls with a certain FTR. And we don't see the enhancer-promoter interactions that we're actually interested in. They, they just don't come up. Okay, so you, you need a more sensitive approach. Okay, and very quickly, this is a high CDC. It's negative binomial regression. Okay, so we are looking at bin I and bin J, and we're saying there's um, uh, systematic sources to uh, the variation. Okay, so the first thing is, 
this, the number of reads decays with genomic distance. So we model that with the spline, okay? So this distance, DIJ, that's the, the most important thing to model. Um, there are other sources of variation, like you can imagine if you have a lot of restriction enzyme sites, you can see that region better and mappability and GC content, okay? So we can learn from the data what the background model is and then we can say how surprised we are when we see a high count and we can do a negative binomial uh, z-score, right, or we can um, assign a p-value. Okay, so that's what we do. Um, now let's get back to the problem of <laughs> predicting the contact map. And we're going to um, use our high CDC z-scores because if we can predict them, then we already have a notion of significance, right? So we can actually use the prediction, not just look at it, but we could, you know, do some analyses with it. Okay, there's this... Uh, idea that's from a paper a, a few years ago. Uh, the algorithm is called CISRO. It's very popular, okay? And the idea is that maybe uh, coaccessibility in single cells or metacells tells us about 3D interactions, okay? Very appealing idea, right? So in single cells, maybe if I see pairs of sites open at the same time, if there's some um, correlation, maybe that tells me that there's a loop, okay? Or uh, in, in particular, this is used for promoter-enhancer interactions. Okay, so it's completely unsupervised um, approach. You um, compute this uh, coaccessibility matrix and you do a graphical lasso and um, uh, uh, there's a few other steps, okay? so. Um, and I'm showing you an actual coaccessibility matrix and the corresponding normalized high C. And you see there's some structure, but it's a bit faint, okay? And in particular, if you look at true interactions versus non-interactions and you look at their coaccessibility distribution, there's a shift, but it's not very strong, okay? So essentially this, this method can enrich, but it won't give accurate predictions, okay? So um, you really need a supervised method, right? And what we wanted to do was train on paired single cell attack and high C data and learn a model that will allow us to make predictions in new cell types from single cell attack alone, okay? So no other... Um, uh, inputs. You just you you're in business if you have a single cell attack data set, um, and also we didn't want it to be a super heavy deep learning um, approach that required specialized infrastructure. We just wanted to be able to train on standard GPUs. So this is the model. Uh, it, it, it used to be called single cell origami, but then another method <laughs> took our name, so it's now called Chromafold which hopefully is still a good name. Um, okay, so we're using two kinds of inputs from the single cell attack. We're using a pseudo-bulk, um, and, and in fact we have a, you know, so the pseudo-bulk accessibility profile, um, and in fact we have a data augmentation where we're sampling um, different numbers of cells to generate the pseudo-bulk so that we can generalize to um, different quality data set at test time. And then we also do this kind of coaccessibility over metacells similar to Cicero. And finally, from the DNA sequence, we just have a CTCF track, okay? So we take some CTCF motifs and we have predicted track. So you don't need CTCF chip seq, you don't need additional experimental data. This, this is all we did, okay? And then we have two feature extractors um, for the 1D and the coaccessibility and combine them and we make a prediction. We're actually just predicting along this V stripe and then combining them. Okay, so it's kind of not predicting a whole patch, but just these stripes and that keeps it um, uh, easier. Okay, so just to show you first, um, 
can you learn, you know, is this enough to learn um, the contact map? Okay, so certainly in a held out chromosome, um, looks good, okay? So the performance is good. This is the ground truth and this is the prediction and it's getting the structures right. Um, you can see the co-accessibility down here, so some of the inputs. We're not using the CTCF chip, okay? And just doing some model ablation, you, you can see everything helps. The co-accessibility helps a bit. Um, the motif tracks help. Um, okay, so that's in your training cell type. You can learn and, and test on how the chromosomes. That's not really the point, right? The point is to generalize to entirely new cell types. Um, and this is what we're doing here. Uh, we are, I believe this is um, cumin ES data, and I'm showing the ground truth at the bottom. This is the full model with the CTCF motif, and this is if you don't have that CTCF motif track, okay? And it, it's, in, in certain cell types, it's really important. Um, uh, to get the right structure, okay? And these performances, this is the test data. Always the co-accessibility helps a bit. Okay, so this is cool. We can generalize to new human cell types, and, and this is always evaluated on held out chromosomes that we've never seen in training. Um, what happens if we now go to mouse genome? Okay, so again, we have lots of collaborations and people are generating very exciting uh, single cell attack data that you couldn't um, as easily do in humans, okay? And what I'm showing here is um, now the ground truth is at the top and the prediction is at the bottom. We're taking the model trained in human data and just predicting in the mouse genome, okay? New genome. Um, and it still works, and we're looking at specific sites that are really important. So this is uh, the BCL6 locus in um, germinal center B cells. This is sort of the master regulator of the germinal center reaction, and um, IKZF2, Helios, is an important gene in regulatory T cells. And you can see that the structures look good, and I'm not showing you, but they're also cell type specific, so if you look at the Helios locus and um, germinal center B cells, it you know, doesn't look like this. It looks like um, the cell type specific organization. And I'm, I'm also showing some loops. Um, uh, so uh, ground truth versus predicted. Okay, final few slides on this. Um, benchmarking. Okay, so I, I mentioned at the start of this section that um, this was motivated by a method called Cicero, which is just an unsupervised statistical score. So if you benchmark against Cicero, um, so uh, yes, these are the loops that, uh, so Cicero evaluates by um, connecting uh, uh, peaks, attack seek peaks with loops, um, and loops only up to 500 kV. Okay, so these are the experimental loops. This is chromafold, and this is Cicero. So you can see Cicero is a bit off, right? And, and the performance is actually not good, okay? So, and that's to be expected with an unsupervised method. Okay, and then finally, there are actually many, many methods that try to predict um, high C using DNA sequence, um, this is one called c.origami. C um, it uses a full sequence model for DNA, as well as cell type specific attack seq and CTCF chip seq. So two other inputs, very big model, um, state of the art performance, uh, and the attack seq and CTCF allow it to generalize to new cell types. At least you can try to make predictions new cell types. And what we found is that our model, just using single cell attack, nothing else, can do as well or better than um, C origami and new cell types, okay? And this is one where we do better, but in general, I would just say e equivalent performance. So this is C, this is C origami on a test cell type. Um, uh, this, I think this one is, uh, you know, one is with just the motif, one is using, yeah, the second one is using the chip, okay? The chip helps a bit 
better, but it's another assay, so it's better overall just to um, use the motif. Okay. Oh, final point, last slide on this section, and I'm probably running out of time, so I'll be very fast for the last part. Um, one application, okay, so you have this model and it can predict uh, the 3D structure from single cell attack. If you actually have a complex tissue, so for example, if you have single cell attack from pancreatic islets and you have high C in the tissue, but you want to deconvolve which interactions come from which cell types, you can fine tune the model on this paired high C and single cell attack and then, and, and then make predictions in specific cell types. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. We take chromafold, we fine tune on this data, and then we're trying to make predictions which interactions come from beta cells and which come from alpha cells. Okay, so glucagon is what's secreted by alpha cells, and you know, this top is the overall high C, and this is the prediction for alpha cells and the prediction for beta cells, and in, in particular, there are certain loops that we predict are in alpha cells, and this is the, in, uh, the locus that, that uh, encodes insulin, you know, and we can again see that in beta cells there are more regulatory interactions. Okay, and there's sort of more systematic evaluation too. Okay, that's what I want to say about Chromafold. It's a supervised deep learning method. It allows you to make predictions um, of the, the 3D contact matrix from single cell attack alone. Um, it also allows you to deconvolve um, chromatin interactions if you fine tune on paired single cell attack and high C. Okay, last, last uh, thing uh, that I wanna tell you, this is really simple. Okay, so I can, uh, these days we have a lot of multiome data um, uh, where you have single cell attack and single cell RNA from the same cells and you know, the, the idea is that this should really make it easy to figure out which enhancers are regulating which genes. But what most people are doing is just correlation. So they look at um, accessibility of some peak, they look at a gene, they look at pairwise correlation over cells, and, and they give a statistical score. So there are sort of obvious things to do to improve over that, and this is our obvious thing, which is called Scarlink. Um, it's that we are going to learn a, a, a Poisson regression model gene by gene, okay? So for a particular gene, we're trying to predict the single cell gene expression from the single cell chromatin accessibility. We include the entire locus, uh, plus or minus 250 kb, okay? And we're, we're no peaks, no, you know, it's just, again, the tiles. And you have to do a bunch of things right, but fundamentally, it's as simple as that. It's regularized Poisson regression, okay? So you're, um, this is a, <laughs> a cartoon where you have three cells, right? You have your input, you have your output, and you learn a regression model. Um, and the idea is that once you have the regression model for the gene, you can interpret it to find enhancers, associate them to genes, to the gene you're modeling. Okay, so here's a simple example. I think um, uh, this is, uh, we're, we're training a model for ZEB2. This is human uh, uh, peripheral blood PPMC data. Uh, I'm looking at pseudobulk accessibility over, for different clusters, and I'm also looking at the distribution of gene expression for those clusters. And here's the regression model at the bottom, and you can see like two things immediately. Like first you can see there are sites that are, seem to have really big signal, it's accessible, but the regression model is saying zero. That's not important for predicting this gene. And if you look at it, you can see, oh, that's a promoter for a different gene. Okay, so it's open, it's not gonna help me predict SEP2. And then there are other um, regions with high regression coefficients that also, that seem to be open in cell types where the expression is high. So it, it seems to be doing something reasonable. 
Okay, I'm running out of time, so I just say, you know, there's a bunch of these kind of unsupervised scores, ways of summing up accessibility to give you a, an expression-like score. This is supervised, so you know, if you evaluate on how that sells, it's gonna do better than, at least on good quality data, than Archer Gene Score, Dork Score, Cracker, isn't a, you know, so it does better. That, but that's not really the point. The point is to understand the cell type specific enhancers from the regression model. And here, I really don't know if you can see, but what we're doing is using Shapley scores, which is a feature attribution method that's sort of used in more general models. Here, we're just using the linear version, which is really simple, okay? And um, the statisticians can come at me after if you think this is the wrong thing to do. But, oops, sorry. Um, what I'm showing, if you can see in, in blue, are the tiles that are important based on Shapley analysis per cell type, okay? And, you know, this is a gene called uh, CCR7. It's important, important for homing, homing of T cells to the lymph node. It's, uh, and, and there's a particular um, uh, SNP that is associated with asthma. It's important by Shapley analysis in CD4 and CD8 T cells. Okay, so it's sort of allowing you to maybe think about the cell type specificity of, of um, disease-associated variants, okay? And more generally, you can do a large-scale analysis and show that this Shapley analysis, cell type-specific Shapley analysis, is enriching for fine-mapped GWAS uh, variants and also EQTL variants in the right cell types. Um, and this, we're just comparing to Archer and it's doing better, okay? Um, I think I'm out of time. I'm, I'm gonna skip the last uh, part and just go to uh, the summary and so there's time for questions. So I, I told you about cell space, which is a sequence-informed embedding for single cell attack. I told you about chromafold, which is predicting the contact matrix from single cell attack alone. And I told you, told you about Scarlink, which is learning single cell regression models from multiome that allow us to understand how genes are regulated in a cell type specific fashion. Okay, and uh, I want to uh, thank all the contributors and, um, and collaborators, and especially Kushal Day for the, uh, for the Scarlink uh, human genetic analysis that I breezed by. And I'm happy to take any questions.